Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Uh, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming along to this webinar series. Um, we are primarily a bushwalking group. And so it is difficult during these current COVID restrictions and the ever changing restrictions for people to do their usual bushwalking program. So we thought we'd try and offer something a little bit um, different, something online that can't be put into lockdown that you can still enjoy. So um, I'll just switch over now to my presentation. And I actually, you probably won't see me in my face or you might sort of see me back towards the end. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. And we are going with this presentation. Okay. Okay, so you guys able to see the presentation? Yes. Okay, good. Thanks, Sam. Alrighty, so I've actually been really fortunate um, that I've been able to spend a lot of time interacting on a, a really close level with, with our native wildlife. And not only <clears throat> the wildlife that we find on terrestrial on the land, but also the wildlife that we find in the sea. So I initially started off as a wildlife rescuer for Sydney Metropolitan Wildlife Rescue. Um, and that is in a voluntary capacity. And I did that for around five years. And during that time, I did what's called the basic care course, which is the one where you're allowed to care for um, all adult birds, all ad adult possums and lizards that aren't very dangerous, things like blue tongue lizards. So you wouldn't get goannas in that category. Um, so that's the basic course. And then you can go on and you can actually do specialities in different courses. So I chose to do venomous snake rescue and handling. Excuse um, me, Shani. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Can you just start your slideshow, just make it full screen for us? Oh, sure. Thank you so much. If I can figure out how to do that. Are you able to see the next slide? Is that what you're... Uh, so we just want to play from start. So we can see the slides at the side, um, but it's just a little bit too small. So, okay, this is frustrating. It did it before it worked it properly. Before, so, yeah. And now it's gone into this funny mode. Um, and I'm not sure I can, oh, that's frustrating. Take the next slide view off, maybe. Oh, does that work? Uh, I just not slid yet. it, no. Just, it sometimes has a bit of a delay. Okay. Not yet, no. Oh, sorry, so if guys. You, if you just do um, slideshow from beginning or play from start. Um, um, That's it? Yep. Oh. No, no. Nope. It was. <laughs> I don't know what I, okay, this is weird. Let's start um, screen sharing again. Okay, is that it? Yes, that's beautiful. Okay, Thank great. You. Great. Awesome. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I did the venomous snake handling um, and then I did the baby bird course because baby birds are very special, specialised type thing. But there's lots of other courses that I could have gone on and done, uh, such as, you know, dealing with bats and flying foxes. You can go on to, if you've done the baby bird, uh, sorry, the baby possum course, you can then go on to doing... Um, you know, marsupials, you can do, uh, sorry, like kangaroos, and you can also do wallabies and things like that. Um, so yeah, there's lots, lots of opportunities if anyone's interested in, in looking after those sorts of animals. Um, and then I was lucky enough to actually work at Sea Life Sanctuary, um, which was located in Manly. And so during my time there, we actually had lots of animals brought in um, and we rescued lots of animals, uh, mostly things like sea turtles, sea snakes, um, and some marine animals like rays and sharks as well. So that was really cool. And I'll sort of go through some of the adventures that I've had with wildlife rescue at both of those uh, facilities. Okay, this is really, sorry, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Oh, there we go, great. Okay, so basically looking at what the threats are to our native wildlife, basically humans, we are the main threat 
to wildlife. <laughs> so things like land clearing, removal of native vegetation, people convert their backyards to lawns and plant exotic plants. Um, obviously, lots of animals get hit on the road, like by cars. Marine animals such as turtles and penguins get hit by boats. Um, people use lots of poisons in their gardens and they poison rodents, um, which is a bad thing because then, you know, things like owls come along and eat the, the dead rodent and then they die as a result of poisoning. Um, when I was a wildlife carer with Sydney Wildlife Rescue, um, the terrestrial native wildlife, actually, we would have to say that probably 50% would be attributable to dog and cat attacks. So a huge amount. Um, due to that and um, ingestion and entanglement of plastic debris is a particular problem that happens in the ocean because sort of a, a lot of it ends up down there. Um, <clears throat> now, one thing that people are not aware of um, that I really like to make um, known is that cats have really toxic saliva. So you hear the stories of people say, oh, my cat brought in a, a little bird, but it was okay and I released it um, and it was nothing wrong with it. What we find is that even a tiny little scratch from a cat or as tiniest of punctures will almost certainly lead to an infection and then a slow death for the wildlife. So even if you were to have your cat bring in a lizard or a bird or something or a possum, it's always a good idea to then contact a local wildlife centre and they'll actually go and get a course of antibiotic treatment for that animal over the course of about a week so that they don't die. Um, okay, I'm going to talk, uh, when I talk through the slides, this is the last boring slide, I think, with, with just words and no images. Um, so as I talk through, I talk about the different levels of care. So as a carer at Sydney um, Wildlife Rescue, you know, different people have different facilities at home. Some people live on a farm and they can have gigantic flight aviaries. Other people live in a unit and they might just do sort of critical care with animals in a, in a small basket. Um, so depending on people's ability to care for different animals, depending on what their work situation is, um, people can choose whether they go for, you know, um, different animals um, that they wanna be trained in, in learning to, to care for, but they can also just maybe do part of the journey for an animal's care. Um, and, and then hand it over to another carer. And there's a whole network of people that, you know, once you do get an animal in care, you actually first off have to call your coordinator and then they ensure that you're actually giving them correct care and link you up with others if you need that. Um, all right, so, so I obviously did venomous snake handling. Um, and one of the things that comes, comes up <laughs> often is that you'll be called out to do a snake relocation. So one of the things that's really important when you find wildlife either in distress or, or ill is to actually note exactly where it comes from, exactly where it was found, because we can't really be moving animals too far away with, where they were originally found. If you're doing that when you're releasing animals back into the wild, you're putting them into a completely different sort of territory where they now have to set up a home. They have to like defend that against, you know, the other animals in the territory. So it is really important to try and release animals back as close to the location as you found them. Now, when it comes to venomous snakes, <laughs> people don't really love having venomous snakes on their property. Um, so what we would do in that instance is, is move the snake to bushland nearby, but still not that far away so that hopefully the snake would be able to orient to where they actually are. Um, it is really important not to do any wildlife rescue if you haven't been adequately trained. And um, when I did my first venomous snake handling course, they actually showed us this picture and they said, can anyone point out the eastern brown snake, the one that's, you know, the second most venomous in the entire world? <laughs> and the answer was that they're all, in this image, they're all actually brown snakes. Um, and they come in a variety of, of different colours. Some of them have this banding. Babies often have this little black head with a white band behind. So it's really important you know, if, you, if you're not trained, don't actually just jump in and start, you know, playing with animals, particularly venomous ones. 
um, because you need to know what you're doing. And even for me as a, as a venomous snake handler, I'm not 100% with my snake ID. So if in doubt, I, I just, you know, every snake is, is an Eastern Brown as far as I'm concerned, or I have to deal with it in that way if, if I'm not sure what it is. Okay, so moving on to critical care. Um, so critical care is when an animal is really significantly injured. Um, you don't want them to be moving around too much. You want to just be letting them rest as much as possible, making sure they're hydrated and giving them some food to eat. Um, sometimes they'll be so ill that they'll be unable to eat food as well. Um, in this state, often you won't even leave a water bowl in with the animal because they may be so weak that if they were to, you know, fall into the water bowl with their face, they may not be able to pull themselves back out and they can die. So this sort of care um, is quite easy to do in, in a small apartment or something like that. Um, and as you can see from the foliage, we know that um, the koalas eat, you know, there's several types of eucalypt tree that they can eat. Um, obviously getting the correct sort of um, diet for them is really important. So as a, as a wildlife rescuer, what I would do when I had animals in care, particularly possums, is, um, you know, go around the streets each evening and actually collect foliage from the neighbourhood. Um, now, all foliage is protected in the national park, so we were never allowed to enter a national park to take the foliage out of there. Um, and we're also not allowed to release animals into a national park because the animals in the national park would already have their stabilised territories um, and you don't want to add other animals in there and, and sort of upset the balance of that. Um, yeah, so that's the critical care stuff. Then um, the next sort of level up is when you move to a bigger cage, maybe something, it's called a Tim cage. It's about a, a metre tall and, a, and half a metre wide, something like that. Um, you know, you might have an animal, probably not a koala. Koala is probably not a very good example. Um, but say, for example, once I had a, a brush tail possum that actually had a spinal injury. Um, and unlike humans, they can actually, animals can sometimes recover from spinal injuries. So this brush tail possum was basically paralyzed from the waist down. So initially we had it in critical care in a basket, just resting, trying to get that spine to heal. And then once he actually started to get some movement in his hind legs, we put him into a slightly bigger cage, a Tim cage, and so he could sort of move around slowly. Um, and then the next level of care it's important when things have been in care for a period of time, um, they actually lose condition. So that, you know, that brush tail possum, you know, had four months of being in care before he was released. Or if you have something like, you know, a cockatoo that's maybe in care for a month or so, um, upon release, the animal's going to be really unfit and unhealthy. So, you know, it'll take off, it'll fly up into the first tree and then it'll be like out of breath, struggling, you know, for air. Um, and then it's, you know, prone to be predated on. So it's really important before animals are released that they're given the opportunity to actually rehabilitate and build the muscles back up and get really fit and ready to go out into the world. So for that sort of situation, you know, these people that have large farms and they have huge flight aviaries and stuff like that, then they can put raptors and eagles and, yeah, really cool things like that in. Um, and they get the final stage of care before they're released. Okay, so we're coming up to baby bird season. In fact, I can hear a lorikeet uh, near my house every morning, a uh, little baby lorikeet calling um, for its parents to feed it. So I guess an important thing at this stage is, is a lot of wildlife rescuers actually end up having to deal with baby birds that are fledging um, and they, they're actually in the normal stage of learning how to fly. So they, they jump out of the nest and for the next sort of three days, they try to fly and they crash and burn lots of times and they eventually sort of figure it out, hopefully. Sometimes they get predated on, that's sort of part of nature. Um, and sometimes they also get injured in doing so. Um, 
But one of the things that people inadvertently do is they say, oh, no, a baby bird's fallen from the nest. I better take it to the vet. And then um, us carers end up having to try and reunite the baby birds with their parents. Um, and there's actually a myth that if you touch a baby bird, that its parents will then reject it because the smell of the human is on the bird and um, they, won't, they won't feed it anymore. That's a complete myth. Um, so yeah, if I got a baby bird that was at the fledging stage, again, knowing exact location is so important for these rescues. So we can go back to the exact location. And there's been times where I sat there for, you know, maybe five hours, up to five hours waiting or moving around the area. So take the baby bird, put it on the ground, baby bird's nice and hungry, calling out to mom and dad, come and feed me. Um, and then hopefully what should happen is the parents will find the bird and then come back and start feeding. Um, and then at that stage, you, you go, great, my work here is done and you can leave. Um, so there are some times when birds do fall out of nests and they tend to have less feathers. Um, and in that instance, what we actually do, as long as there's no injury, or it's, it can be hard to tell, we think there's no injury, creating a makeshift nest and putting it up securely in the tree. Um, and then, you know, sitting around and making sure parents actually are actually attending to the bird and, and feeding it and things like that's really important. Um, something sturdy that holds up to the weather. So cardboard boxes are that ideal if it rains. And also just make sure that you have some holes in the bottom because if it rains, you want to make sure there's some drainage. We also want to make sure that um, the nest is not too deep. So the bird is actually able to, when it needs to fledge, actually jump up and, and try and take that first flight out of the nest. Um, yeah, and too shallow, you know, they're just probably going to fall out again. So yeah, um, that's what we do for, for baby birds out of the nest. I actually had this really interesting experience one day. My flatmate was coming home and he found a lorikeet in the guard, uh, sorry, in the driveway. And it looked about the stage of fledging, but it was injured. So it wasn't like we could just reunite it. We actually had to, to, um, to do some treatment or let it, let it recover. So what I did was I put it in a little, little tiny cage that I had and I put it on the back balcony. And the coolest thing happened is the parents found where it was. And for the next five days, as the bird slowly recovered and, and its injuries healed, the parents actually did all the feeding of the baby lorikeet through the bars of the cage. So even though their baby was enclosed in a cage for five days, they sat in the tree above with the other siblings of, of the baby um, that was in the cage and they stayed with it and continued to look after it and feed it until yeah, we were able to, to let it go. So that was a really nice sort of um, nice ending and nice to watch the whole time really. Um, okay, magpies, my number one favorite bird. Um, <laughs> so I hadn't actually done the baby bird course at this stage and um, technically you're not supposed to look after baby birds until you've done the baby bird course, um, but we get, inundated, absolutely inundated every spring with so many baby birds and so many that didn't need to be rescued, couldn't be reunited. So I ended up with five magpies and I can't remember, it was a long time ago, it was Maggie, Molly, Minnie, anyway, there was five of them and they're adorable. Um, and just to give you an idea of like how much harder it is for people to actually rear wildlife compared to their well compared to their parents who would just do it naturally and do it so much better there was actually so much involved with these magpies so initially um it was feeding them their proper diet um their proper you know wildlife rescue diet which is um mints mixed with some insectivore mix and you also have to add calcium now just as a side note i will mention people that feed magpies mints when the magpies take the mints back to the nest to feed their babies, there is not enough calcium for the baby's bone growth. So what happens is the babies cannot fledge. Their bones don't grow. They cannot fly. They cannot stand. So it is critically important that people don't feed wildlife. Um, 
the only exception I would ever say for feeding wildlife is if it was really struggling or if in the instance of, a, of maybe an aggressive magpie, making friends with it. <laughs> that would definitely work. But yeah, so anyway, so I ended up with these five baby magpies. And so first I had to get their, their food mix. And I think it was like five times a day. I had to go down to the aviary and hand feed them. Um, and when I wasn't there, I was making my daughter go and do it. And, you know, it was really hard. Like I was rushing home, you know, in the middle of the day and doing crazy feeds, like in my lunch hour and stuff. It's pretty hard. And we had so many baby birds, I actually couldn't palm them off to other people. I ended up having more, got five, and no one else would take them. But anyway, we got there in the end. So then after you've fed them as a parent would, you need to get them to realise they have to pick up the food themselves and have to find it and be able to eat it. Um, so you start putting the food sort of on their perch or next to them on the cage of the aviary, sort of stick it there, and hopefully they start to peck at it until they sort of figure out how to eat it. When, once they've sort of got that down pat, then you start putting all their little bits of mints on the ground because that's where they eat, they forage on the ground. So they need to start learning how to do that. Then the next stage is actually teaching them how to forage for, you know, wild grubs, like actual insects and things. So a compost heap comes in really handy. Um, you grab a bunch of compost, get the worms and all the bugs jumping around. Um, and to do this, I would actually open the aviary, let all of the magpies out into the backyard and <laughs> we would get the compost there and I would actually have to demonstrate and sort of show them and pick up worms and things like that and actually feed them to them until they sort of figured out that they could pick out the food themselves. And then from there, you know, you go on to, you know, they start to learn how to fly and then they start to... Um, do little things like you let them out and then they might fly over into the neighbor's yard and then they'll fly back. <laughs> so you do what's called a soft release and you eventually sort of let them make their own way in the world, but they can come back to your backyard and you continue to support feed them from the backyard if they need that. Um, but eventually they establish themselves. And this particular group of five magpies were absolutely adorable and they sort of established themselves as a, as a little family group up the road. And occasionally when I would walk my dog, it was, I just see these five magpies that would, would follow me and then make noises at me and follow me sort of down the street. And I think that was these five magpies. I couldn't recognize them, but they could recognize me. Um, so yeah, magpies are amazing. My hands down favorite birds ever. Um, okay, so moving. Oh, so we had a little duck. <laughs> My daughter probably wouldn't like to be shown in this image. This is her about 10 years ago. Uh, so we had a little duck, not the greatest photo. Um, and basically, it was the end of the season. It was coming on winter. We tried everywhere. We tried every branch of Sydney wildlife to find another duckling or other ducklings to put this single duckling with. We tried other organizations like WIRES. Nobody had a duckling. So we had this poor little one duckling. And what happens with birds is they imprint. So the ducky thought he was a human. So what we did is we put him into a, um, a little three, three foot aquarium with no water in it and put a heat lamp up one end and then a feather duster. And the feather duster is, um, the, the bird thinks that's sort of like their mother and they generally hide under there, but stay warm in that area. But it's really important to not just leave the duck all by itself. You, you have to actually interact with it. Otherwise they do die of loneliness. So, um, so we would get it out and we, you know, we'd spend time with it and, and, and things like that. Not ideal because you don't really want them to be thinking that they're human. Um, you want them to be ducks. So anyway, after he got to the stage where he was ready for flying and swimming, he went to another carer who had a swimming pool. Now she had a fresh water pool um, and she was the, the water bird coordinator. So she did lots of ducks um, and she actually lived in Narrabeen right next to the lagoon there. So the hope was that the duck would sort of learn to swim, learn to fly and eventually gravitate over towards the other ducks in Narrabeen. Well, that didn't kind of happen. And then so Ducky ended up going over to um, 
a correctional facility out, out in Windsor where they have huge flight aviaries and aviaries full of, um, you know, huge big, um, um, sorry, like waterways going through them. So you've got swans and pelicans and all sorts of birds all interacting in this huge big outdoor um, enclosure. So Ducky eventually went there um, and I didn't hear, but hopefully Ducky would eventually be released into the wild once he's sort of able to behave as a duck. Um, yeah, so he was really cute. Um, okay, so then I did um, some stuff at Sea Life Sanctuary. Um, and this was one of the turtles that we rescued. Um, this massive operation <laughs> to rescue this turtle. We had, um, we had scuba divers ready, we had swimmers and snorkelers, um, and it was in the sanctuary at Manly. And the turtle had been seen over a number of, of days and we knew that it was um, uh, not looking very well. Now, if you look at the turtle, you can see it's actually looking really, really thin. Um, and around its face um, and around on its flippers and things, you can see there's some barnacle growth. So typically that demonstrates to us the barnacles or the algae growth shows that the turtle is not well because algae and barnacles only grow at certain depths. So, you know, uh, well turtles will be able to dive really deep. They'll also swim into different areas. Um, and typically the swimming action at certain speeds and, and diving deep and things like that ensures that the, the growth just doesn't take hold. It ends up dying off. But when animals are sick, they don't do as much diving and as much swimming. So that's when the growth can really take hold. Um, now this awesome guy, Maurizio, he was one of, um, one of our, in, in our swimming group. Uh, unbelievable guy, can hold his breath six minutes. Um, he was the one that ended up being able to get Shelly and to bring her really nicely and, and slowly to the surface. And then we got her into care um, and she did really well. Um, I will just say, so turtles eat jellyfish. And um, one of the biggest things that turtles ingest is actually balloons. Now, this is what happens when helium balloons um, go up into the atmosphere when they're let go at a certain height they burst and this is the pattern they make when they burst then they land usually back down often in the ocean and they look exactly like jellyfish so guys it's really important not to use balloons they're not biodegradable as they're as they're said to be and they're just such a problem for the environment that they're not really needed and we should just be completely banning them particularly those sort of events where people release hundreds of balloons um it's just you know it's just littering and it's just destroying our wildlife anyway so shelly made a huge recovery here she is looking a lot better um we did uh some fundraising and bought this amazing tracking tag. We thought, yeah, we want to know where turtles go. Um, there wasn't a lot of research around to say where green turtles go. We know they swim, you know, all over the, in all the oceans, except sort of the, at the poles. So, you know, they, they're swimming all over the globe, but we didn't really know much about them. And researchers generally don't know much about them. So $6,000 that tag costs. And Shelley decided not to move. So he's, so she stayed in the bay for the next 18 months. And um, this is a, probably a month later. The tracking tag actually didn't do too well. It became covered within algae because she decided to stay because the food was so good there. And she must have bent the antenna when she wedged herself under a rock. So basically the whole thing stopped working after about two weeks. Um, now she's not left with that tracking tag on her for the rest of her life. Just wanted to let people know that Turtles actually shed their, their shell, just like snakes shed their skin. Um, and they shed um, each indi individual scoot on the back, you know, that sort of section of their shell, like, there's lots of scoots on the back, like big scales. They, they shed individual scoots. So when we put a tracking tag on a turtle, we try and actually glue it on so it covers a few scoots. So, you know, it'll take longer to come off. Otherwise they sort of come off within sort of six months or so. Um, and she's a very cute little turtle. Um, now, some animals just can't be released back into the wild, unfortunately. And then what happens with these animals if 
they're lucky is they get a second life as an education animal. Um, so this is Tassie, the smooth Tasmanian ray. Um, and she was a resident of Manly Sea Life Sanctuary. She was caught by a fisher. Um, and the, when he was pulling her up onto the boat, he actually broke her jaw. So instead of her being able to open, open her mouth quite big, like almost the size of a dinner plate, it was more like, you know, just a, just a small fish, like I'm holding there, feeding her, um, could fit in her mouth. So um, she, we had to feed her multiple times a day. Uh, the other rays could eat sort of every couple of days. Um, whereas if you went and did a penguin feed and you had some left over, you'd come down and you, all you had to do was stomp three times on the platform. And then within, a, within 30 seconds, Tassie would literally come flying out and then she'd jump up out of the water in front of you like this crazy thing. And then you'd be able to feed her a whole bunch of fish. Um, and it used to be really fun to take guests, you know, friends in and you wouldn't tell them what was going to happen. You just bash on the thing. And the next minute, this huge, gigantic stingray sort of jumping out of the water at you. Um, but she was adorable. Um, okay. So hands down, the coolest rescue I've ever been involved in is, is Fluffy the white shark. Um, also the hard, one of the hardest rescues. And, and we honestly don't really know what the result was, but um, Fluffy the white shark, we had a report that there was a shark that was beached at Manly. So the guys went down and several times they tried turning him around and steering him back out to sea. And he repeatedly just kept beaching himself. It's like he didn't have, um, orientation to where he was swimming. He was kind of swimming haphazardly in circles. So the guys quickly put him in the, the little um, the little ocean pool and um, obviously got the people out of the pool. And then what we had to do then was actually, he stopped, he stopped swimming for a while, was sitting on the bottom. So they actually had to pick him up and walk him around the pool to get the, because he's a ram ventilate ventilating um, shark. So he needs to swim in order to keep the, the water moving across the gills so he's able to breathe. Um, so we had to do that for a little while and then he managed to get himself moving again. But white sharks are really bad for keeping in captivity. And every time anyone in the, on the earth's tried to keep them in captivity, they don't live very long. They don't understand the concept of walls. Um, being out in the ocean. So they literally, he just kept swimming around and smashing into the wall. So this picture you can see on the left, he's in the, he's in the ocean pool. Um, and you can see his snout and his mouth's a little bit cut up and along the pectoral fin. Um, so we got, you know, this is Jack in the water doing, we had people stationed at every corner. And as he came around, we kind of had to redirect him so he wouldn't crash into the walls. Interesting though, I mean, he was a baby shark. <sighs> probably like 1.5 meters long. Um, yeah, he, he, I've, been, I've been attacked by so many animals I've tried to rescue. <laughs> um, he didn't try to attack. I think he, or like he didn't, even out of frustration, he didn't sort of go get off me or anything like that at any stage. He just really just was trying to swim so he could breathe. Um, so he's a very, very sick shark. Um, now we had to, because he's, um, because he was um, a threatened shark, because he's um, listed as, as uh, not endangered, but threatened. Um, when you have an animal like that, we had to actually alert the Department of Primary Industries because it wasn't up to us what we did with the shark. It was their decision as he's a protected species. Um, and it took them a while to figure out what we could do with him. Um, and it was getting late. And they said, yes, we had permission to take him out of the heads to release him out to sea. At that stage, it was too dark and it was too late. And they gave us permission to bring him back to the aquarium for the night. So we could put him in a really big tank with no other fish or no other animals and try and, and help him. So we all got to spend the night babysitting a, a white shark on shifts. Um, and so there was two of us in the water with him at any one time. And we're in the water for about an hour and a half. And um, we just basically spent the whole time redirecting him from crashing into walls. Um, and then the next day they were able to take him out and release him out the head. So I'm actually gonna stop 
the share for a second. And then I'm going to jump into a different share screen and try to show you a video of the release. Okay, can you guys see that? Is that okay, Sam? Yeah, that's coming up through. Okay, cool. So, yeah, we put him in this really hard to get to tank, but it was a huge tank with nothing else in it in the middle of the aquarium. So, here you go. So he had some water going across his gills um, while he was in the boat. <laughs> okay, so they said it was a great recovery. I don't know if we can really say that, to be honest. <laughs> we don't know is the answer. Really hard to look after and care for an animal like that. And they have to keep swimming the whole time, so you can't really stop them. Um, and, you know, you'd have to take blood and try and figure out what was going on and then work out a treatment all the while where they're just going to deteriorate further. So we had to release him and kind of hope for the best. Um, I'll just go back to the presentation. So um, a big part of what we do is to educate the public about um, wild, wild animals, native, native wildlife. Um, a lot of people don't realise that things like echidnas and um, blue tongue lizards, you know, can quite happily hang out in your backyard. A lot of people freak out blue tongue lizards are actually snakes when we get there. Um, and then we just show them that they've actually got legs and they're not snakes and they're okay. Um, one of the funniest call outs I ever heard was that um, someone got called to a house where there was a snake. They arrived and the snake was actually a dead dried worm. Um, so people, there are some people who really have no idea about nature. It's like they've never even dug in the garden before. Um, so, so giving people education is really important. Um, people hate bandicoots because of the damage, the damage that they do to people's lawn. Um, so I'd like to tell them that they actually are eating the grubs out of the lawn. They're actually aerating the lawn, which is actually good for the lawn. Um, and the cool thing that bandicoots do is they actually eat funnel webs. So they're a good thing to have in your garden. Um, all right, so if you're gonna do wildlife rescue, if you think you'd be interested in it, just like anything, um, safety first. <laughs> this is a picture of me. Um, attempting to pick up a brown snake. This is my first venomous snake handling course. Um, and the snake did a really quick turnaround. Um, and I'm really lucky I didn't get bitten that day. So, you know, we, we, we deal with dangerous animals. Um, so it's important to get the right training um, and not to sort of jump in there and just try and rescue any old animals. Um, there's, you know, animals that you wouldn't think are dangerous, like things like a cormorant, or a data, you know, those birds with the really long, sharp beaks. Um, an important safety message for rescuing those is you need eye protection. The first thing they do is they try and go for your eyes. So yeah, knowing what you're dealing with is really important. But I think, you know, it's important for people to, um, you know, if you find sick or injured wildlife to actually maybe, there are some things you can do, like you can secure the animal so potentially it's unable to escape um, before, so you can then call wildlife rescue. You know, if it's in the house, you can maybe close the door. Um, you can maybe throw a box over it or a towel, you know, something to sort of con contain it. 
Um, so it can't escape. Like I said, knowing exactly the location of where things are found is really, really important. Um, obviously, another one is ensuring that you check the pouch of any marsupials that you find. Um, obviously, it's only the girls that have a pouch. The boys have two testicles that are really, really obvious. Um, so it can take a while to, to sort of get into the pouch. Um, Obviously, possums also have a pouch, so it's not just kangaroos and wallabies. Um, wombats also have a, have a backward-facing pouch. Um, if the baby, if you find a joey in a pouch and you're actually able to gently, easily pull the joey out and there's no sort of resistance um, and the joey has some fur on it, then in every likelihood, it can be hopefully rescued if there's no injury. So the best thing is then to wrap it in a towel as this girl is doing, and then to sort of maybe shove it up your jumper to keep it nice and warm with your body heat. Um, if you found an animal inside a pouch, but you're unable to remove it, if there is some resistance, usually when, there's, when the babies are very young, it's imp imp really difficult to get them off the teeth and you can actually damage their jaw by doing so. So in that case, we actually recommend you take the entire dead animal to a vet and then they will work out how to get the baby out with their techniques. Um, you can always pick up trash. There's trash everywhere. Trash really affects our environment and affects our wildlife. There's too much trash to pick up often. So what I do is I tend to try and um, triage. So things that I can't walk past are things like those dome cup lids that you get from Maccas. Animals stick their head through the lid looking for the yummy smelling stuff and then their head gets stuck. Um, hair ties, shocking. See them at the beach all the time. Just pick them up. They don't need to be around. Balloons, plastic bags, anything in, in a circle shape that can kind of entangle things, I try and get rid of. Um, yeah. Then it's also good to be in contact or know who your local wildlife rescue groups are. There's a lot of them. Um, New South Wales has like over 20 groups. So I didn't think listing them all was gonna be helpful, um, but the New South Wales Wildlife Council has a list of them. And I found the I4 app is really helpful because you can actually, it'll tell you based on your location, who the local uh, rescue orgs are. So that comes to the end of my, Screen share. And, um, and now we can take some questions. All right. Thanks, Shani. That's really appreciated. And um, the thing I really like about your presentation is, uh, you know, none of us or um, maybe some of the people on the uh, call are already um, uh, trained wildlife carers, but it struck me that this was very much the equivalent of that um, that first third aid first aid certificate, where you're giving us enough information to bring in the professionals, the the people who have been trained, and a bit of an idea what sort of has to happen beforehand. So, look, thank you very much for that. Um, I've got to say, I did get this little chill down my back when you were um, talking about the different varieties of brown snake. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a photography tragic, and a few years ago. Um, saw what I thought was a little yellow-faced whip snake, snake on a track in um, George's River National Park and I sort of got out my macro lens and sort of got down on hands and knees so I could get a nice sort of close shot at which point I realised that it didn't seem to have much of a yellow face or any of the sort of the black stripe through its eye and thought mm -hmm. yeah this could be a baby brown so maybe time to just sort of back up a little bit and because um, I'm not sure you can put tourniquets on noses can you? Um, <laughs> Anyway, so let's have a look at um, uh, questions. There's, I noticed there's one from our friends over at the Australian Wildlife Society um, who's talking about their snippering initiative at the moment. I'm just wondering if you might like to, um, well, first, Shani, if you're aware of that and maybe we can sort of pass on some information. Okay. No, so, look, what we'll do is... Um, while we're talking, I'll get out that petition, which is doing the rounds at the moment. But just to let everyone know, the nature of that initiative is to is to really encourage people that whenever you're discarding plastic, and particularly plastic that um, 
could be constricting. So that's things like those little round rings that sort of go on every one of the bottle tops, the screw on bottle tops to actually cut it before you put it in the bin because the, the incidence of native wildlife actually sticking their heads through that is really distressing. And it's one of those small things that we can all do as individuals that actually reduce the, the risk for wildlife. Okay, so I've got a message from oh, Ingram. Are. Oh, okay. I'll just sort of note that um, Margot is also, Margot Smith is also noting that um, disposable face masks, which we are all taking as we leave the house at the moment, are likewise a, a hazard just in terms of the, again, they've got that capacity to constrict anything that sticks their head through it. So um, again, if you're going to discard them, just take that couple of seconds to actually snip them so that we're not going to end up with um, little tragedies down the, down the track from all these things. Um, okay, a question from Ingram about uh, asking where they can go to get trained as a wildlife rescuer. Yeah, so every, my understanding is every wildlife rescue organisation would have their own training. So. I did my initial training through Sydney Wildlife Rescue, uh, Sydney Wildlife Metropolitan Rescue, they call themselves. Um, and then WISE also does their own courses. Um, some of us joined forces. So recently I did a venomous snake handling and that was Sydney Wildlife people with Australian seabird rescue people. So yeah, um, yeah, maybe just contact any of those uh, rescue orgs that you're considering being uh, working for in your local area and they can tell you how to how to become trained. Okay and we've got a great comment a uh, great bit of advice here from Georgia um, who had the experience only a few days ago of finding a very unwell um, green turtle uh, near Gibbon that there's a extremely useful WIRES 101 online course that you can do so that would be a great one to have a look at. Uh, all right. And Shani, you'll be pleased to know that um, there's a couple of comments here with people commenting on how much they appreciated the, um, the marine part of your presentation. Although I've got to say, I'm still trying to come to terms with anyone describing a great white as fluffy. Uh, that there was just this little bit of cognitive dissonance there as you, um, as you presented that piece, but I guess um, yeah. Anyway, that must have been an interesting afternoon in the pool. <laughs> it, well, it was very fun, yes. Yeah, bucket list for all of us, I think, yeah. Um, right. um, Shani, I just noticed that there's also a couple of people who've mentioned that there's, um, that one of the places that you're likely to find injured wildlife is actually associated with road kills. And I'm just wondering if you can give us any indication of, I guess that really difficult decision of where it's worthwhile, when and where it's worthwhile contacting someone from an animal rescue um, organization when it comes to pouch young. Sorry, um, I missed the start of that. Um, I'm, just, I'm just reading and reading the comment that um, from Silky, Silka. Yep. <clears throat> the female roadkill. Yeah, sometimes if, okay, if it's a female and obviously has a pouch and the pouch is, if the pouch is quite elastic, it could be that the baby has jumped out and gone somewhere else. So it's it's good to look around. That's a good point. Um, and what you will see on the side of the road sometimes is you'll see an animal that has already been checked and it'll have spray paint, a big X on it. So, you know, those ones have been checked. So you don't have to check them. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, that know? gets us there. And look, uh, I'm not seeing anything else, but before we um, before we finish up, I just wanted to actually ask you one of the ones that um, I often see around my local area, which is that phenomena of species like sacred kingfishers and um, kookaburras, uh, and even sometimes the sulphur crested cockatoos where the youngsters come out of the nest quite early. And I think you, you mentioned situations where um, people would assume that those young animals aren't being cared for, but the reality is that mum and dad are actually keeping a, um, an eye on them. Could you just sort of walk us through what might be some of the species that you're commonly likely to see around um, 
around our local patches that fall into that category? Oh, okay. So yeah, um, I guess lorikeets are a good one. Magpies see them everywhere, sort of um, teaching their young how to how to feed. Um, yeah, I guess just trying to. Uh, yeah, sorry, I can't think off the top of my head, Gary. Just that's that's okay. I've got to say the ones that I, we see here locally all the time are the young sacred kingfishers, which sort of um, seem seem to be out far earlier than they should be. But um, but the truth is that there are watchful parents out there and sort of yeah. keeping a bit of an eye on them. Is there a miniature version of a kingfisher that's that's blue, Gary? That's do you know? Uh, well, look, I, I can only talk from Sydney. So we've got two that are common here, which is the sacred kingfisher, which is the little forest kingfisher. Um, and they're a, they're a great one for folk who have um, goldfish ponds because they're, they're quite adept at sort of taking advantage of that. And down in the creek lines, of course, you get the beautiful little azure kingfishers, which are much more of a specialist at taking um, aquatic prey. You'll, you'll often see them with yabbies and um and shrimp and small fish that they catch so they're so it's a bit less of an issue um all right and fiona has asked whether you could comment about um how you go about identifying beak and feather disease in young lorikeets yeah it could be hard to to know with lorikeets um yeah i've actually with them in suspected cases i've had to go to the vet and I think they do some sort of a scraping and then look under the microscope um, and have to do a test to actually identify it. I mean, yeah, sulfur crested cockatoos, it's it's pretty obvious. They get that extra long beak that keeps on growing and then the, their feathers sort of start falling out and they look hideous. And then all the other cockatoos, you know, basically tell them to get lost. Um, yeah, lorikeets, it's, it's much harder to tell, um, but highly contagious. And it's really important that if we do have cases of beak and feather disease that they're, you know, they're taken out of the population. And unfortunately, yeah, they, they either end up being euthanized or they become, you know, people's pets as long as the people don't have them having access to other, other birds, which can be a problem because sometimes the wild birds will visit the, the captive birds. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay, and look, what, one other one I might just sort of mention to everyone that sort of flows out of what you said, and that was those comments you made about the dangers of feeding magpies and, and other native fauna, um, things like mincemeat. Uh, and what I'll say is that, you know, from my, um, the, my time working in national parks, that was actually quite a common problem. And you tend to find out about it because neighbours would be really concerned about the number of um, distressed, dead and dying magpies and currawongs and crested pigeons in their, um, in their backyards. And, you know, it's, it's a strange situation. Um, I think feeding is more about satisfying the humans than the, the animals. And if we could just remember that that's the case, um, it might sound a bit counterintuitive. But if people do get to the situation where they're concerned that um, harm is being done, there actually are powers under the National Parks and Wildlife Act for the, your local parks office to um, issue directions for people to stop feeding inappropriately if you're, if you're in that situation. They don't like having to go to that extent, but it's, um, it's one of the few options that you have in that case where people, are, with the best will in the world, they're actually committing harm rather than um, help. And that's the thing I really like about wildlife rescue because as a human, we have that annoying propensity to want to go and touch and cuddle and annoy wildlife. You know, we just, we can't leave it alone. So become a wildlife carer then. If you really yeah. want to touch and annoy them, you get to do it, you know, well, you're supposed to keep it as hands off as you can, but you get to do all those things. And then you can just appreciate them in the wild when they're, when they're healthy and you don't have to annoy them like people do. All right, look, um, can I ask everyone, this is one of those strange Zoom things, but if you go to your um, reactions box down on your lower panel, there's the opportunity to send Shani a virtual sort of clap of um, thanks for having provided this for us today. Oh. And um, Shani, I, I really want to thank you and congratulate you on the sort of the um, 
you know, a really interesting and engaging uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Um, just a little reminder to everyone that this is uh, something we're setting up as a weekly series. Um, next week, I'm actually going to do the presentation and my focus is going to be on the sort of the getting the best out of your Uber Uber local sites. So um, I'm just going to focus on a single little tidal pool in the middle of Royal National Park down at Cabbage Tree Basin and some of the, um, the things that live in that relatively small pool and some of the changes that I've been observing over the last decade or so in that area. Um, we are all really constrained about how wide we can range, but there's nothing to stop us actually looking a little bit more intently and deeply into the, the places that are out part of our local patch. So I hope that you can join us next week. Um, and I've got to also repeat my request for members out there, you know, particularly folk who are coming from other parts of the state than Sydney, um, we'd love to hear you as speakers in this series. So please just drop us a line at uh, mpansw.org.au. And um, thank you to everyone for your participation and most particularly thanks to Shani and Sam for organising today. All right, bye everyone.